flight. Messi! Still on my flight. <laughs> then else over with DHP, are you here? No, emergency in the ER. <laughs> University of Auckland. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Someone get a new MC. <laughs> University of Canterbury. What's up? Open Polytech. Hey, yeah. <laughs> and the OER Foundation. Have I missed anyone out? Yeah. Rock and roll! Oh, yes, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I introduce the technology? Oh. So who do I miss out? Mesh? Yeehaw! Great job! And, and, and skills for work? Yeehaw! Hey, Aoleki? Yeah. Roll call, yeah? Yeehaw! Well, Aoleki. Yeah. Yeehaw! Who else have I missed? North Cape. University of Canberra! University of Canberra, wow! Yeehaw! Yeah. Traveling further. <laughs> oh, I won't throw it because I'll take someone's eye out. <laughs> so I'll bring it down to you. Hey, is it chocolate fish? I'll meet you halfway. <laughs> is there anyone else I've missed that I haven't? North Tech. North Tech, welcome North Tech, thank you. I think the loudest and most boisterous was probably Well Tech. Yeah. So you can come up and collect your chocolate fish at the end. Now just some quick notices, uh, fire evacuation for the Nelson School of Music. We've got exits down the end where the exits are. There's an exit over here and there's an exit over here. In case of an emergency, assembly point is in the car park on Nile Street opposite the Nelson School of Music. So there's a car park directly across the road. That's the uh, assembly point. If you'd like to pick up a packed lunch on Friday afternoon after the last session, please put your name down at the conference registration desk. And there's a whole bunch of student helpers from NMIT. They're wearing blue NMIT t-shirts. You probably would have seen them on the way over. You might have thought you were at the Olympics for a minute there with all the, the helpers on every corner, but no, they're here to help. And if you, can, if you want some help on something, just ask them. Thank you very much. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Graham Bell who's our Director of Planning, Quality and Learning Services at NMIT. And he did have a warning for anyone who was here last year. Uh, he's going to redo his intro. <laughs> so if you please laugh, even if you've heard it before. I'd like to welcome Mark <laughs> Graham Bell. Put your hands together. National Tertiary Learning and Teaching Conference. Tinehari Koamato Kuatai Kikuto Kite Afina I I'm Director of Planning, Quality and Learner Services at MIT, Pickles for short. Knowing uh, Rangia How and Tenakoto uh, Tenatato So it's my duty and pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Tony Gray, our CE, to Nelson, to MIT, and to this wonderful building in the Nelson School of Music. The theme of the conference is Building Futures. How do we successfully build futures for our students, our staff, our communities, our economies, given the challenges and pressures we will find ourselves under today? The subtitle this year is Hindsight, Insight and Foresight. Last year my welcome contained much hindsight. I waxed lyrical about my time as a student in the 1960s. It had a little insight and not much foresight. This year at NMIT, along with everybody else, we've been busily preparing our 2013-2015 investment plan, requiring some hindsight, much insight into the current operating environment as it impacts over the next two to three years. 
The investment plan is essentially a bid for funding for TEC. But we've always taken the view here that uh, there's a much wider audience for the plan, embracing all our stakeholders. And we've taken the opportunity to, opportunity to be as foresightful as possible. And I'm quoting, if you don't mind, from bits of our investment plan. We at NMIT strongly believe that the learning environment in which we operate is changing dramatically, impacting on both the short and the long term. The traditional model whereby an ITP prepares students for the world of work by teaching them mainly technical skills for a job is not sustainable. Drawing on the work by the Gazelle Group, Enterprising Futures, the changing landscape and new possibilities for further education, we take the following position. <coughs> work is not the same as having a job. Most people in the future will not have single track corporate employment. People's working experiences will be much more varied and unpredictable in a world of continuous disruptive innovations. The effectiveness of individuals and work groups in all working scenarios depends on personal qualities of enterprise, networking and creativity, coupled with up-to-date technical competence but going beyond the acquisition of skill-based qualifications. Learning is work and vice versa. The institute-based structures on which today's education systems are built largely separate education from work, both in time and place, and do not provide the dynamic experiential learning environment needed by tomorrow's workforce. Learning and work are inextricably part of the knowledge economy. Quite simply, we are training students for jobs that don't exist yet. We therefore endorse a new learning paradigm aimed at developing the working capabilities of individuals and organisations based on the concept of entrepreneurial learning breaking down the divisions between education, practice and work within real-world learning experiences. So we believe the role of NMIT will need to change dramatically to meet changing local, regional, national and international needs. Early last year, uh, we embarked on a strategic foresight initiative. This aimed at scenario planning NMIT's future looking 10 to 20 years ahead. Central to this project was a workshop at uh, which all staff attended um, at the Fakatuma Rai, just down the road here, aimed at identifying the key issues and opportunities facing NMIT. Some of the key opportunities and challenges emerging from the exercise were as follows. Firstly, there's an accelerating move from the BRICS business model to the CLICS business model. Secondly, there are huge opportunities and challenges associated with global free access to course content. Thirdly, there's a real likelihood of radical government budget reduction. There's a need for our programmes to fit the real world of today. And finally, there's a need for us to focus on sectors where we have competitive advantage. Um, and just as an aside, when we had this, this workshop, all the staff were there, we constructed this, um, this game. Um, there were 26 teams in all, I think, and we had, they were in four groups. There were funders, the government, philanthropists, Richard Branson and so on. We had stakeholder groups, the wine growers, the fishing industry. We had providers, individual ITPs, and we, we uh, created imaginary combined polytechnics. We had an international private training organisation, and each, each group adopted one of those roles. And we had students, we had a group of baby boomers, we had the employed, we had the youth, we had parents of 14 year olds. And what they had to do, most of the afternoon, was to, big hall just like this, was to negotiate agreements between each other um, to ensure a sustained tertiary education for 15, 20 years ahead. And they also, so they went off and did deals with each other, it was all very exciting. At the end of it, we realised we hardly ever talked to the student groups. We were too busy doing deals with funders and other influences. I did exaggerate that a little bit. It wasn't quite as bad. As so I'm looking forward to this year's conference. 
Again, we have over 140 participants, 40 presentations, and we're honoured to have several past Excellence Award winners. Alison Campbell from the University of Waikato, Sita Chan from CPIT, Margaret Henry from the University of Auckland, and Salita Nepal from UNITEF. I'm also very excited about this year's keynote speakers. We have Dr. Peter Coolbear. It's always a pleasure to listen to and be inspired by one of the real thinkers in New Zealand tertiary education. His topic is developing evidence-based strategies to support improved organisational performance in teaching and learning. As we at LMIT have got our external evaluation and review in a few weeks, I'll be hanging on Peter's every word. It's great to have Dr. Wayne McIntosh here. From the, he's the Director of Open Education Resource Foundation, who will introduce us to the new exciting development of the OER University. And we at MIT are proud to be one of the founding anchor partners of that university. We all know, of course, that in spite of all the global developments in new approaches to teaching and learning, the importance of the tutor in the classroom will remain central to many a student's experience of tertiary education. So we're honoured, therefore, to have Peter Hickson with us, sorry, Stephen Hickson with us. Stephen is a recipient of an award for sustained excellence in tertiary teaching in 2012. And being an ex economics tutor myself, I'm looking forward to hearing how he makes the dismal science come alive. There's some debate on who made this first quote, but we'll go with Mark Twain. College is a place where a professor's lecture notes go straight to the student's lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> I look back at some of my one and a half hour economics lectures in the 1970s and 80s with not a little embarrassment. But now, looking through the programme, it's a stimulating and humbling to see the innovation and passion and sheer quality that today's tutors bring to their profession. Before closing, I must acknowledge the support from Akataroa, our gold sponsors, thank you very much Bridget, and the Nelson School of Music for making the splendid hall available to us. I must also thank my colleagues and friends at NMIT, Carol Crawford, Dave Sturrock and Jane Dillon, for all the work they've done over and above their normal duties to organise this conference. And finally, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Catherine Savage and Erewa Tarina to make our first keynote presentation. Catherine Naitahu is the Kaihatsu Chief Executive at Te Buhai A Rehoa, a partnership between shareholders, CPIT, Lincoln University, Otago Polytechnic, Darunanga O Naitahu, the University of Canterbury, and the University of Otago. She is a registered psychologist and has worked as a classroom teacher, an educational psychologist and a university lecturer. Her research is focused primarily on culturally responsive pedagogy and positive behavioural interventions for Maori learners. Erewa is manager, strategy and relationships manager working alongside Catherine. Following the February earthquake in Christchurch, Erewa was second seconded to develop EBA Maori workforce development initiative to support the rebuild. The largest of these has been the rekindling of Maori trades training. Euro has a strong interest in the revitalisation of Tereo, Maori oral, oral traditions and the organisational design of indigenous corporates. I've had many discussions on teaching and learning with Doc Ferris, who's our Director of Maori Education, as some of you met earlier here at NYC. And what's become quite clear to me is that when it comes to teaching and learning, what's good for Māori is good for everyone. E kiana e te whakatoki, nā taroro o nā tākaroro, te ora e te iwi. With your food basket, my food basket, the people will thrive. Nō reira, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tātou koutou. Tēnā tātou, tātou arātou nei, mahana. 
Tāku tiro no ha, te kāhui whetū e tu mai rā Tu mai a wero i te nimihi, tu mai a wero i te kōkoto Tu mai a wero i te maria, tau kē e te patu nui o ai Tere taku waka ki uta, tere taku waka ki tai Tere ki te kāhui whetū a rākai hau tu e tu mai rā Tu mai, tu mai, ko waitaha, ko māmoi, ko tahu, ko wau O reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa Kia ora everyone, um, well, I'm not a doctor, my name is definitely not Catherine, so I'm Eruira Tārena and she's given me the honour of um, yeah, he wāwāhi i a mātou kōro uh, to open our, um, I suppose, the, the section that we have to us um, I runga no i tērā, tuatahi, ka mihi ake, uh, ki te mana whenua, te hau kāna, te kopa iti, uh, mō rātou te mana o tēnei whenua so, First thing to our relations of the Tauihu that welcomed us this morning um, to their beautiful Takiwa and also I thought I didn't speak this morning so I thought to start us off we'll do a bit of a quarter or a bit of a virtual meeting. So um, that's what I'm going to do to start us off. Um, I, I thought we'd start talking just about Whakapapa. So if you don't understand the language, yeah, there are some beautiful things said this morning and uh, it's, there's a level of poetry that's very Shakespearean. And I always find it hard because the poverty is really, we have two rituals that are left in our culture that are still living today. One is the poverty, the Māori welcome, and the other one is our tangi. And so we always have this internal debate, it's like, why are we being so eloquent with our language and 99% don't speak our language, so it just, it, it, there's no point to it. But then of course the other side of the argument is of course that if, if we compromise on those last two rituals that we have left, then what will we end up with? So it's one of those challenges we always have, or always a debate that goes on between a few aunties. And uh, one of my aunties is always cracking me saying, never ever speak English, this is all we have left to hold that ground. So she wrote uh, one of our genealogies, so I'm going to share that and talk a bit about that and sort of try and describe in a visual sense um, what Whakapapa is all about. I'll start. So probably the first thing, when I say whakapapa, I mean genealogy, you know, your family tree. So we all have a worldview, a paradigm, yeah, all our societies have circles, uh, we have a unique cultural worldview that's different from other cultures, well, the Māori, the paradigm of the Māori worldview is genealogy, whakapapa. So we trace our descent from gods, and the gods uh, have domains, the natural domains as well, and so you have genealogies for trees, genealogies for birds, for fish, for people, and through those genealogies you can trace from an individual right back to the gods, to the natural elements themselves. So you have genealogies for tangible uh, knowledge, so knowledge has a genealogy, so even intangible things. Um, anyone from the Canterbury would know yeah, if you look at some of the genealogies from Tuahiwi, from Kaiapoi, then the winds have a genealogy. And uh, the one that's the Tuakana, that is the eldest sibling of all the winds, is the Norwester. Because it's the, the wind that um, Kiana put the Hokai Tangata, the, the wind that devours people because it always makes you feel tired. So, yeah, every place is different, but you have a genealogical connection to everything around you. So you have sort of like a mirror identity system. When you look at your moment, you see yourself because your genealogies are reflected back to you. Does that make sense? And so we went through this ritual this morning, it was neat listening to Ken. It's a bit intimidating, he's sort of saying, oh, you know, in the old days, you could have been lunch. Um, <laughs> but that's exactly part of it, that you know, we have circles. Yeah? And in the Māori worldview, you had to be kin. You had to share whakapapa. And so in our oratory, the first thing you do when you stand up, is you recite your whakapapa. So you establish how you are related, how you are kin to that group. And if you're not, then you're outside of that circle. And there's problems <laughs> when you're outside of that circle because then, in effect, you're not part of that world view, you're not connected. Does that make sense? So I thought, well, I'll try and establish my genealogical connections to place. So the first thing is, so that's me down the bottom here. So my name is Iruira Rōtaka Tārena. So Tārena is the Māori Naitau uh, word for Sterling. So if you can see there, my mother is Iranui Hine Kaitaki Sterling, my father, grandfather Waha Sterling, 
and I get my namesake, uh, Inuweta Sterling. So, probably the first thing is it's really unusual to talk about Whakapapa in an open space. And we heard some about Whakapapa experts, and they, they describe themselves as saying, well, Whakapapa is kind of like comic book geeks. Um, everyone has these little books that are tucked away in a secret place, and they'll sit around the table and they'll talk Whakapapa. And if you don't understand the vocab, if you're not familiar with it, then it just makes no sense at all. So I'm not an expert in Whakapapa in any street sense of the imagination. Um, actually, I have a real problem remembering people's names. <laughs> so if you think of an art form which is about reciting ancestral names, and you can't remember names, and you're not very good at an art form. But I always look at Whakapapa visually. So I look at the patterns, how they form, and what they can tell you just by their structure in terms of political alliances, how the Whakapapa get truncated and elongated. And so that there are stories just even in the dynamics of Whakapapa. But I just wanted to point out that I feel quite comfortable because Iruera Sterling, um, my great-grandfather, formed a relationship with Professor Anne Sama um, from the Auckland University. And so she published a whole series of books about his life, about his wife, Amelia. And so my genealogy has been in the public domain from the 1970s. So if anyone ever challenges me, I said, well, you can go with your library card and get my genealogy anyway. Uh, it's online, I can Google it. So putting it out there isn't a big deal for me. Um, he had some beautiful kōrero from Takuta uh, Ferris. And if you look at um, Maki, well that's my connection to Takuta. So yes, he's from here, he's from Ngāti Raukawa, but he's also from Maitahu. And when you have an orator with that much style and grace, then you always try and claim him. <laughs> so uh, if he was here, we'd be trying to put the word on him, try and draw on those Naito connections to get him to come a bit further south. But one of the things are that, that Naito actually migrated through this area. And so I'll talk a bit about that. So you have Kawere. So if you can see there. So if you look, that's what, you know, sort of around 10, 12 generations back. Kawariri marks the point when Naitahu actually migrated into the South Island. And so you have Tuahuriri who was based in Wellington. Uh, he went off in search of his father Tumaro, and Tumaro actually crossed over here into the Nelson region. And it was in pursuit of that relationship in search of his father that you start to have one of the first instances of Naitahu migrating down into the South Island. So that's just the first thing that Kath and I, we represent Naitahu, so we're not mana whenua here. Um, but we do have some ancestral connections to this landscape. So some of our old iwi past sites are scattered around. For some unknown reason, we either moved or got kicked out, uh, much to our um, you know, detriment, and moved further south. But there you have Makere, Kawiriri, the Te Ao Bukuraki, the Naito ancestor. So he was based in Wellington and Hataitai. So at that point, Naito were actually not based in the north and um, south island at all. And then you have two Haitata. So if you look at our culture and a lot of our place names, um, a lot of our place names, especially around Canterbury, around Southland, descend from these ancestors who never ever set foot in the South Island. So two Haitata was a Naito chieftainess that was based around the wider upper, and most of the place names are around Christchurch, actually even Kolok Bay, Oraka. So they stem from events that happened and with her family in the wider up. Now, if you were from two Haitara, you could actually branch off there and go back to Tahu Portiki. So the first thing is Naito, we descend from Tahu Portiki, who's about another seven or eight generations off on a different line from two Haitara. So everyone know Paike, the whale one? Well, Tahu Portiki was the descendant, the, the child of Paike. So we are descended from Paike from the whale one. And so that's our genealogy from the east coast to the north island. And we migrated down, and it wasn't until you can really only see that, in that sense, only 12 generations ago, Naito had migrated into the south. So we've actually had very strong connections with the east coast and the north island. The thing is, there were already people in the south before Naito who moved down. And so when we moved down, we had a whole bunch of skirmishes. How you deal with it, you call it the Tato Ponimu, the green stone door. So you basically have peace marriages. And so, as I said about Whakapapa, if you were to look at this, they would have tried.
and where do you work now? Now I'd like you to draw a connecting line between those things. Who has a dot on the dot on the paper? Oh, you guys. You need to be a bit more adventurous. <laughs> if you, who has a really big circle or triangle or star on their paper? Yay, for you people. So what you've experienced in your life is probably what we call cultural dissonance. And it means that when you go somewhere, you feel a little bit out of place. Because maybe you were brought up somewhere else where you went to school. Or maybe you went to school somewhere and then you got a job somewhere else. Maybe you've come from another country. And most often people say, oh, people that come from overseas really understand what it's like to be, or to um, want to know about Māori, want to learn all. The reason they do that is because they come and they feel cultural dissonance. Geez, there's something really different about New Zealand. What is it that I feel here? So if you've got a really small dot, you actually probably haven't experienced that much cultural dissonance in your life. You've stayed quite safe and you've stayed with people that you know. Put where you've had a really good overseas holiday. You're all lecturers, you have heaps of money. <laughs> <laughs> You've probably been to Paris or Italy or France. Okay, who has been to Cambodia or Thailand or Vietnam? Right, there's some cultural dissonance. Go to the toilet. I'm just talking about this last time. <laughs> How do you know when you experience cultural dissonance? Because you walk into toilets and you go, what do I do with the wee bowl and the pipe? How do, how do these things work? That's cultural dissonance. You're experiencing something which you're not quite used to growing up with. So we know when we experience that because we feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not too sure what it is that I'm supposed to do. What I want you to do now is turn around to the person behind you and I want you to take, take about four minutes and work out a place that you have in common. It might be a place you go for a holiday. It might be where your kids live. It might be uh, where you work. But I want you to find a place in New Zealand that you have in common. And don't go for no cities. No cities. It has to be a town. And where do you work now? Now I'd like you to draw a connecting line between those things. Who has a dot on the dot on the paper? Oh, you got Three of you together found a connection. Shows you the power of place. So place is a real connector, just like fucker papa. So while we not, may not be able, if we're from a different culture, to pull our lineage back to people, we can always centralise on place. We have places that we have in common. So for me, I grew up, even though I'm going to and my whakapapa is to Colac Bay, right down the bottom of most in the South Island. Uh, that's where my family comes from, that's where my whanau comes from. I was brought up in Waio on the East Coast. Anyone pick that place? Yay! <laughs> um, did someone pick that as their place? No, okay. So I, I was brought up in Waio, which is on the East Coast. I went there, I, I taught there. I was a site on the, right up the East Coast to Hicks Bay. Um, and down to Lake Tutera, so I worked on the East Coast, Poverty Bay, and then I moved to Wellington, where I worked at Victoria University. Um, all my degrees come from Massey, who's Massey? Yay, Massey people in the room. So all my degrees come from Massey. I left the big, well, I actually left Warrell to go to the big site, which was Palmerston North. <laughs> <laughs> and that freaked me out, so I just went back to Warrell and taught there and stayed there for another eight years before I got the courage to move to Macon and move to Wellington. So the reason that I'm telling you that is you can make connections with me. Someone from Wire on the back is going to know who I am. And you're going to, yeah, you're going to work out, afterwards we'll work out how we're connected. So place is a really, really important thing to make connections and establish relationships. It also tells people who I am. One thing about difference, clear difference between Māori and Pākehā, Pākehā will say to me, how come you're standing on the stage? So most of you thinking, why am I listening to you? Whereas uh, Māori will say, where do you come from? I want to know who you are. I don't really care what degrees you have and what your research is about, but I want to know who you are. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes not. So my degrees, or the reason that I think I'm standing here, is because uh, my background is in educational psychology and teaching, learning, curriculum design, and mainly in culturally responsive teaching. So by that I mean teaching in the mainstream, and teaching Māori, and teaching for diversity, so difference in the classroom. 
I was an evaluator on Tegel Tangitanga, which is the main uh, educational intervention in our secondary schools in the North Island. I was one of the people who did it. I was one of the people that researched it, which is a way better job, because you don't have to do all the hard work, you just get to look at all the evidence. Um, I, I work with Angus McFarlane, who's from UC Canterbury, he's a professor there, and we both work in the area of behaviour intervention for Māori students, so we're working on a big project called Hua Kina Mai at the moment. So that's what I sort of do in my professional life. I've been at Te Tapawai for about 18 months, and I was brought in to change direction for the company, to do something new. So Edu and I uh, started at the same time, and our, our brief was really to be innovative and to do something new with this company. So I'm here today to talk about building futures, hindsight, insight, foresight. Always a good conference topic. Because it is important to look back at the past and say, where have we been, where are we now, and what's coming in the future? Why is that important? Because we don't teach in isolation. We don't sit in a university or a classroom or in any sector of education and do that out of context. We do that in the context of the social and political environment. We do that in the context of education and policy. We do it in the context of money, which is what education has become about. So we'll take a little time to just go back and say, where are we now? What are we in here? Did the system just come out of nowhere? Well, it didn't. It came out of that industrial, we inherited this industrial system. And in that system came these assumptions about learning. And they come from the, what, 19th century, which was education as a production line. You come in at a certain age, and when you're five, when you're six, when you're seven, when you're eight. So we have year groups, and you learn, you scaffold through that learning. Learning is linear, so it happens by steps. What's one of the things that we've done in our education system? That's massive in our schools at the moment. We've imported national standards, which really is saying step one, step two, step three. And if you don't learn in that linear line and you don't fit the mould, national standards isn't very good for you. So we hope that we all learn like this. We say that ability can be measured, so I can measure what you're actually capable of, I can measure what you can do. That's measurable. That certain people are fit for certain things. And you might think, oh, that's a bit harsh, but that was the assumption of the education system that we inherited. That if you're brainy, you do these subjects. What subjects are those? Math, science, physics, and chemistry. If you're not brainy, you might be good with your hands, or you might be good with your drama, or your music, or your singing. So we say certain people are fit for certain things. And knowledge has value. So learning is good. That's a good thing. Thank goodness. So early. Māori did enter our universities, and I'm just going to look at universities because Edith's going to have a look at our politics a bit later. We had uh, Māori Pongmāori, we had Sir Peter Buck, Apirana Nata, who were our sort of first Māori stalwarts of the university, and they did particularly well. But when they went to university in 1870, they certainly couldn't take any Māori subjects. They wouldn't have any access to Māori knowledge. They couldn't go to the Faculty of Māori Studies. So they weren't able to use any of what we call our cultural capital. That's what we bring to our learning. So for me, what some of my cultural capital have been brought up in Wild? Who knows Wild? What did I learn in Wild? How to do good bombs in the weather. <laughs> How to fish. How to white bait. My mum's like a massive white baiter. So I learned those skills. That's my cultural capital. That's what I bring to my learning. And if you can connect with me and my cultural capital, you will make learning much easier. If you could teach me physics based on the projection of my bombing out of the tree into the water, I'll probably understand that. But if you teach me physics with a car on a platform and a stone, it makes no sense to me at all. So how do we access the filing cabinets of our cultural capital? For our early leaders that went through university, they had to do that without using their cultural capital. So up and down the Mata came from Rotoria. Imagine going to Vic. Who do we go to the In Canterbury? Canterbury? Yeah. Imagine going to Canterbury. Canterbury's in the climate. Uh, imagine going to Canterbury and not being able to use any of your cultural capital. So you're learning from a blank slate. Pretty challenging. So actually they had to leave being Māori behind. We had to let that go and we had to learn new skills. So they were our first really prominent Māori leaders, but some of them were actually uh, 
they did actually support policies that ended up really compromising Māori culture and language, like the uh, suppression of Tōhā Pūna Act. That was sort of a key act that really did suppress Māori language and culture, but it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. And as a result of that educative process, that's what they learned. They became, you know, having to grasp hold of some of those essential things that were very European. So we've moved really from the concept of education as a public good and education good for the public, two quite different concepts. Education being good for the public works on the premise that being educated is a right. I am owed that as part of being existing, learning is part of who I am. If we really buy into the concept of lifelong learning, then do we charge for lifelong learning, if that's actually part of your life? So we've bought into this thing where actually education is a public good, meaning it's a product that's bought and sold. It has a value, it's a packaged product. If we look at those two different uh, paradigms, one says education as good for the public, it means that it's about rights. It's about ensuring that if you, have, if you want democracy, people have to have a certain level of knowledge and understanding and literacy and ability to critique policy if they're going to vote. If we actually want to have members of society that can function well in a democracy, they actually all need to be educated. So there's a right there about it. And there's access. We have open access to learning. We don't say who can go and who can't, who's fit, who's not. When it becomes a public good, meaning that it's a product, we then package that and now we define what is knowledge. What knowledge do I need to learn? We make it an entity. We have ownership over knowledge. Who owns that knowledge? We have intellectual property. If there's something, if there's value in it, then someone owns it. And we look at investment. If I'm going to pay for my degree, I sure want to know that there's investment in that at the end of it. Or if I'm going to enter into your diploma, I want to make sure at the end of it I have a vocation or an output to go with that. So the different paradigm that's come into basically education globally is that neoliberal view of education as a public good, a thing which we buy, sell and trade. So Graham Smith in 1997 said, this cultural form of captured form of economics with its emphasis on the processes of commodification and privatisation can be interpreted as new formations of colonisation. That's the C word at a conference right at the front. So <laughs> colonisation. We tend to think that colonisation is a historical process, something that happened in 1870 and stopped in about 1830 or 18 or sorry, 1930, 1960, even 1980. But colonisation is a contemporary thing, it still happens today. So it's still the process of one person or a dominant form overriding another. So having that form. And what we have at the moment, and you can all experience this, is that neoliberal view. The view that you can be measured by how big your house is, what kind of car you drive, how good your job is. Is that right? Yeah. And if you resist that, if you live at you know, Mochuika, where you live on the hippie commune out there over the spectacular, <laughs> You tend to be seen as what? Alternative. You're kind of counterculture. You're different to the norm. So the norm now is very, very situated in the whole idea that a neoliberal force is running education. So what's the, what's the result of that global powerful phenomenon that's all about money? Well, it's all about academic inflation. So when I got a PhD, wow, that was pretty cool. Not that many people had them. But we've actually got well over a thousand mighty PhDs now. So when you look at what used to be, when I first had my master's degree, I'm the first one in my family to actually have a degree at all. Let's just say my first degree, my diploma is the first one in my family. But now it's almost an expectation that you need to have a qualification in order to participate in society. Minimum level two, then you need to at least get a diploma, then hopefully if you get a degree, then you can start to participate in this global economic you know, chaos that we've got at the moment. We've got a focus on human capital or hard skills. That's knowledge. Why? Because that's what you can package and that's what you sell. So there's a real focus on those hard skills. What is it that I'm going to learn by the time I come out of this? Now that's quite interesting when you listen to Graham talk earlier about, you know, we don't know what the future's going to hold. 
We don't know what the environment will be like, we don't know what jobs will be doing, we don't know what business will look like. Yet, we are really prescribed about what knowledge we teach and how we communicate that knowledge. So, it's had an impact on our knowledge, on what we buy and sell. It's seen a compression of the arts. So, any of you teach arts? Oh, one person, two, three, four people in the room. You will know that in high school there's a massive compression on the arts. Why? Because parents are told your kids need to take sciences, maths, engineering, physics, because those are the, those are the, skill, those are the subjects that are going to make you the most money. They'll get you the best job. So my daughter, who's 17, <laughs> she is loves the arts, loves classics, history. Uh, the school had to ring me and the guidance counsellor said, you do realise that your daughter is taking uh, classics and history and uh, not one science. And I'm forcing her to take maths. That's me forcing her to take maths. I guess I said she doesn't want to do any of the sciences. But actually she's quite a bright girl. Oh yes, well she's bright at classics and history. Yes, but don't you think she should do one science? She should do biology. Why? Yeah, here's a kid who has no interest in science at all. She actually wants to do classics and history. So there's bucking them all. But I'm like, nah, do what you want to do because it's going to make you happy. I'll have to support you for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this compression of the arts, arts-based arts subjects, so that's social capital. And social capital really, when, this is how the government measures education. They measure it based on human capital, what is the knowledge that I teach, Social capital, what is the relationships or the networking or the community that comes out of it? So a lot of us are really interested in that social capital. But what are we charged with delivering? The human capital, the knowledge base. So the arts is quite essential to that social capital. It's how we create community. It's what we do in our communities. It's how we express ourselves. It's how we make connections. It's what we might do. So we've seen a real compression of arts-based subjects in schools. We've also seen a focus on transmission, so getting the knowledge across. That transmission approach to teaching, which is what I'm doing now, are you enjoying that? Yeah, transmission, I'm filling your empty heads. <laughs> um, that transmission approach to teaching comes as a result of, I have these graduate outcomes, I have to make sure I meet these outcomes, these are the skills that you need to know, sit down, listen, because the exam's in two weeks. So there's a transmission style approach to teaching. So it does have an effect on what we do and how we act. And a lot of our students are coming to university or higher education not because they want to find themselves or they want to find out who they are or they want to, I took at my degree, papers like German literature and translation. That was fascinating when I learned about Franz Kafka. I mean, I'm a teacher. I was a teacher. I, Actually, I did PE at Teachers College, you wouldn't think, yeah, but I did do PE. But I took papers in literature, I took papers in world religion. I had the option in my degree to take these way out there papers that really told me about things that I had no idea. They opened up worlds for me. The students don't really, not all, but a lot of students come to university going, if I take a government double degree in economics and law, I'm most likely to get a job as a Da, 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 da. So we really compress and push that education and we move towards a very skills oriented education. So, some people's view, and I'll say universities, but I'll also say polytechnics, have come to become supermarkets where people can come along and buy packages and goods, packaged courses that will then output them into these jobs. So we've got a very vocational orientated system and it's very orientated towards getting our job at the end of it. In fact, if you look at policy we do with politics, it's kind of changing a little bit, eh? And they're saying the outcome is not just that you get your degree, the outcome is how many students can you employ. So it's actually even reaching to having uh, politics and universities be accountable for employment. So you can see the focus is on we just need people to work. We certainly don't want them to think. What happens if you all start thinking? You could overthrow us. No. <laughs> we don't want you to think, we just want you to work. So we've lost this sort of creating critical thinkers, creating innovative thinkers, even though the workplace that we are designing and producing them for is changing at such a rapid pace. Part of having a neoliberal view, 
for having this emphasis on education, this product, is that we have to measure everything. We have to be able to measure, because I want to know whether you passed or failed or whether you made the grade. So I have, to do, I have to articulate what is that graduate outcome. So if you're coming to me and you're going to be a teacher, because that's what I know, I'm going to make sure that I have a graduate outcome that tells me exactly what it is that you need to be able to do in order to be a teacher. So it makes me very outcomes driven. Even when I write my papers, I have to say, what outcomes in the graduate profile do I meet? So specifically, what aspects of my course teach this knowledge? And there's a real focus on the tangible, meaning the measurable. And we do that because the intangible stuff is so hard to measure. Who can measure if I'm fit to be a teacher? Probably going to go, no. If I'm fit to be a teacher, who can measure if I have presence? Who can measure if I uh, have good relational skills? Who can measure if I can resolve conflict? Who can measure my empathy? Those are actually things that are immeasurable. So instead of really focusing on those, we tend to focus on the tangible, the quantifiable, the measurable, and they almost overtake what it is that we're teaching. We have to be very conscious to teach the intangible. Creativity, intangible or tangible? Intangible. Although if you don't have it, you know you don't have it. But someone says, what is this? And you say, flowers in advance. If you have creativity, you could say it's a time portal to another world, for example. So you know when you don't have creativity, but very difficult to measure how, how, uh, how creative we are or what it is that we have. So we tend to avoid measuring or saying being creative. And in fact, you'd be in a lot of trouble if you have one of your learning outcomes is to uh, have a creatively inspire a piece of work because you can't actually measure that thing. You get yourself in trouble, so you drop those words off. You don't tend to use them because they're hard. And what that does is focus more on that human capital. So we've got a real focus on knowledge, not so much on those social skills. You might think, what has this got to do with things Māori? Why is she talking about me now? How is this even relevant? Because for Māori, education sits really firmly in that social capital. It's about relationships, it's about learning, it's about networking, it's about people, and all the evidence says that. So we're moving this massive machine of a system to become really focused on human capital, but what learners, and Graham's right, all learners, not just my learners, what they need is the social capital, the support to become. Okay? So it's really an obligation of our universities, not just to make them become workers, so our job is not just to create workers, it's actually to create people that can be critical, that can be innovative, that can be creative, that can support others, that can be leaders, that can be teachers in their own field, that can transmit that knowledge or those skills or be entrepreneurial. These are all a lot of intangible things that are really difficult for us to look into our courses. If we really want to do that, how do we do it? Well, not by transmission. So, we need to focus on who we are, what we bring, and what we become. So that might seem really hippie-ish, I've just come out of Tarkaka. That's not fair, Tarkaka is a beautiful place. But it's true, education is about becoming or being. Some people say that you can't become because that's an end point, and actually lifelong learning is about the process of becoming or being who you're gonna be. And I'm just sort of, I have to say I'm a middle age, so I'm halfway down that, that lifelong journey of Becoming. I'm not at an end point of being. So becoming is about learning. When you become a teacher, I'm going to use teaching because that's what I know. When you become a teacher, I can learn all the knowledge, I can go on teaching experience, I can get feedback, but when I actually step into that classroom and have my own kids, I become a teacher. What comes along with um, becoming a teacher? Power. <laughs> Come on, you're all teachers, there's a sense of power when you're a teacher. I remember when I first started teaching in my first year, and I had to take the kids over to the swimming pool and I said, Line up, you kids, we're walking over to the swimming pool. And they did it. And I thought, well, actually, they're pretty slack and his tail is snaking all over the, the way. And so I said, Stop right there, that's not good enough, turn around and go back. And they did. <laughs> and I went, What? <laughs> so then I went, Stop again, turn around, go back. And they did. 
And it must have taken us 10 minutes to get to the pool. Not because they didn't want to walk, because I realised, oh, I just didn't hear it a whole lot of power. Nobody told me about that at Teachers College. That's actually part of becoming a teacher, is understanding the power relationship that you have with students. Okay? It's there. You can't take that away. It exists. You are the teacher. If you assess or you mark, there's an essence of power in that relationship. I can fail you. I can pass you. It's what we do with that power and how aware we are of the, of the implications that power has on learning. So a good example, at the beginning of this year, is my 17 year old is in high school, that poor high school because I'm a parent, uh, she starts a new high school with about 2,000 students. She can't, she loses her way from equine studies, which is where the horses are, to get to the maths block and she's always late for maths. So she's late for maths eight times. On the eighth time, the dean walks in and says, she's new. <laughs> she's new in the school and she's trying to be cool. You've been late eight times. Get downstairs and get to my office. And so she marches down there and she's saying in between, well, can I, can I, just, can I just explain? Don't talk to me. I don't want to think you're being rude. Be quiet. Listen to me. You've been late, eight late, one detention, that's it. But, uh, but don't answer me that. Can you just ring my mother? Because she knows. <laughs> ring my mother. 17 year old getting upset. I don't want to talk to your mother. You're on detention. So of course she comes home. I go and see the dean. I sit in the dean's office. I look down. He doesn't know me. I sit down and I see I've come to talk to you about the incident with my daughter yesterday. And he starts off with, well, you might have heard one story, but I'll tell you right now there's another story. What's coming? I say, oh no, stop right there. You are not in a position of power over me. We are equal. Let's start this conversation again. So that Dean had really had a lesson in power and the implication of power. I said to him, all you needed to say to my daughter was, is there anything I can do to help you get to class on time? And that little 17 year old would have gone, oh no. I just keep on don't get there fast enough. Okay, well make sure you do. And that whole big thing would have stopped right there here. But there's a teacher who has power, knows he has power, wants to exert that power. So power has an implication for learning. Creates fear in some cases. So we're going to talk about a culturally responsive pedagogy of relationships. Pedagogy being teaching. Relationships being central to it. And don't take relationships for granted. Don't think, oh, I've got good relationships with the students in my class, go, you know, bro, if I can get down with them. That actually isn't how it goes at all. The relationship is a teaching relationship. You can't get out of that. We're teachers. Implicit in that is power. And to some extent, you may need a little bit of that when you fail people or mark people or give people feedback. But there is something about making connections. There is a lot about having positive relationships and how we work through that. Actually, there's a big piece of research that's done by Vic, and it was on um, NCEA results. And what they did was they gathered hundreds and hundreds of students' NCEA results, and they had them all sit these surveys. And the surveys said things like, this is my favourite subject. This is my favourite teacher. That I think this teacher cares about my learning. And then they went back and they tracked the success of those students over these subjects. And what they found was that even if the student didn't like maths, if they thought the teacher liked them, and if they thought that that teacher thought they could do maths, they did well. So the most fundamental thing in achievement was, my teacher believes in me, my teacher thinks I can do this. So relationships, not I hate maths, doesn't matter. Actually, the enjoyment of subject doesn't matter. It's about the relationships that I have with teaching. So we brain really, we know tutors and classrooms matter. That's one of the most paramount things that matter in terms of success. If you look at UNESCO, they got together and had a symposium for higher education. They said, you know, what should higher education do for the society? Because it does have a role in our society, doesn't it? Do you have a role in creating society? Yes. Education is the biggest vehicle by which we normal society, by which we can create society. We absolutely have a vehicle where we have a part to play in that. We're the only really big part that we have in actually having some determinant in that society. 
So that's why the social skills are so important. We actually need to make sure that our curriculum reflects our society and our social problems. We need to teach things like New Zealand history. We need to teach that. People need to understand how, why we have the Treaty of Waitangi, or even what the Treaty of Waitangi is. We need to have how uh, land and formation and wealth in New Zealand has come about. We need to understand things like the impact of socioeconomic status on learning. Does it have an impact? Yes. Does it have an impact because people are hungry? But like Campbell Live would have you believe? To some extent, but man, people learn in the Sudan. People learn in Ethiopia. The biggest impact it has is on our ability to learn. So it compresses, it stresses our brain and it has a psychological impact. When you are under stress because you are living week to week, and even if your parents are under stress, that actually imposes what you can learn. Lots of your students are under significant financial stress. That actually impairs their ability to learn. It's not that they can't buy good food, or it's not that they haven't got a good jacket. That's part of it. The biggest part is that they live under significant stress. So we need to say, what are these social issues? And how do we connect to community? So we don't become something that's a vehicle educating people outside of our community. What's the whole point of educating? Is it for employers or is it for community? Are we doing this for industry? Well, if we say that, we buy into that whole neoliberal view of money and everything. Or are we doing it for community? So we need to think, mm, there might be a little bit of both here. We might be doing it for both. What I want you to do now is think about your experiences as a learner. I want to know about your high school experience. I want to know where you went to school. I want to know how that went for you. I want to know what your perceptions of yourself as a learner were. So what was your identity as a learner by the time you left secondary school? Not now, just then. So tell me, in your secondary school years, where did you go, what were your experiences, and What's your identity as a learner? So just turn around to the people, somewhere around, write down a couple of those things and then I want you to share them. Five minutes, tell me about yourself as a learner.
said to Luna, it's quite a feeling, but you need to find someone going, yeah, I can do this, I've got this. Who's out there? Who left high school? Oh, right, go and do people. Hands up high, did see you? Okay, so high school was pretty affirming, you did quite well, and you felt by the time you left that you were pretty good at learning. Who felt that they were kind of, oh, well, you know, no one really knows that I'm here, I'm just sort of cruising through, and I'm not really sure what I'll do after this. Right. <laughs> Who felt this place hates me? Hate these people? Oh, I suck. It's so bad. I don't know. I'm never going to get back into education again. Right. <laughs> so in the room, we had basically a third of third of third. People that felt success at high school. Those people that kind of just mm, cruise through and get out the other side. And those people that just school doesn't work for you and it wasn't a successful thing. Those experiences as learners shape us as teachers. So we bring that into our teaching. So those people that are good, really good at school, you are good learners, you find learning easy, and then we have people that really struggle with learning and find learning more challenging and quite difficult. That actually shapes how we teach and how we communicate. One of the critiques that we have of maths teachers, are there any maths teachers in the room before I say this? Oh, sorry. So one of the critiques that we have of maths, secondary maths teachers, and it's, you know, it's a cumulus critique, it's mine, um, is that they, they get degrees in maths. They're really good at maths. Man, they were like top of the sixth form, they like got level three, you know, they got a bit of a bachelor of maths. That's incredible. And then they come back and teach year nine maths. To people like me, we go, I'm still counting off the roller. <laughs> so what we do is when you have that really good understanding of maths and you're very good at maths, is that you almost take for granted some of those learning processes and you tend to assume that, oh, I don't know, why can't you get this learning maths is actually quite easy? Or again, these numbers are quite easy. If maths has actually been a challenge for you, then you tend to take that into your teaching and learning and think differently about how you teach. And the same that, those very highly equipped learners of you that are out there, you have really good learning strategies. So you've learnt successfully what works for you to learn. And you probably teach using and teaching those learning strategies to others. So how we, our own experiences actually shape who we are as a learner. So if I gave you time now to say, define yourself as a teacher, you've just defined yourself as a learner, all these years later, I now want you to define yourself. What kind of teacher are you? Give me some words, key words. Hard, where you go. If you don't want to share it, you don't have to. What kind of teacher am I?
cooperative, collaborative keynote. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but that's my vision that I have for the future. So we all need to vision about what that teaching is. We all need to be very aware of how our cultural experiences influence our teaching. The best example I have of this is my five-year-old school interview for my five-year-old. She's using a new entrance. She's gorgeous. Imagine my baby. She started school. We went to a teaching interview. The teacher's lovely. She's a lovely teacher. She speaks to her and she does lots of things in her classroom that really affirm who Imogen is and I really love that. So we're having an interview, my husband and I, we've got an old son, Jasper, at the school. He's 11. And the teacher goes, uh, oh, of course, Imogen is very studious. She's uh, very conscientious and she likes to, you know, even in, re in free time, go off and read in the corner on her own and teach herself to read. My husband and I are high fiving because my other two kids don't like that at all. So, <laughs> yay! 15 years and we won't go right. So, our baby is very conscious. The only problem that we have with Imogen is that she is not independent at all. I'm afraid she's very, very reliant on her older brother. She's so reliant, in fact, that after school he comes in and he puts her shoes on, ties her laces, packs her bag, puts her lunchbox in, picks up her book bag, puts her books in, takes her to the bus, carries all her stuff, takes her off to the bus. You know, the other day, they were out in the playground and Imogen didn't have her hat, and it was hat day, so she had to sit under the big tree. Your 11 year old son came up, took his hat off his head, put it on her head, and sat under the tree for it. I don't know what we're going to do about this. <laughs> so, my husband and I are going, high five, double high five. Because I don't really care if my five year old is not independent. Actually, I could care less. My five year old has years to learn to be independent. My son has one opportunity to learn to care for his little sister, and that's it. And then he's doing a good job. What a wicked kid. I was so stoked that an 11 year old would go up his whole lunch time, put his hand on his sister, and go off and play. That is a fundamental cultural difference. My kids are taught to grow up being interdependent, knowing that someone's ringing me, hang on. <laughs> so my, my kids are taught, up, are taught to grow up and to be interdependent. They're taught to rely on each other, they're taught that if we're not there, they can back each other up. They're taught that if anyone picks on the other one, they'll be in there. <laughs> that's my kids, that's how they're brought up. So that is a fundamental cultural value that's different. This teacher is coming. She's 
started school, we went to a teaching interview. The teacher's lovely, she's a lovely teacher, she speaks to them all, and she does lots of things in her classroom that really affirm who Imogen is, and I really love that. So we're having the interview, my husband and I, we've got an older son, Jasper, at the school, he's 11, and the teacher goes, uh, oh, of course, Imogen is very studious, she's uh, very conscientious, and she likes to, you know, even in, re in free time, go off and read in the corner on her own, and teach herself to read. My husband and I are high fiving because my other two kids. Like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! 15 years and we quite got it right. So our baby is very conscious. The only problem that we have with Imogen is that she is not independent at all. I'm afraid she's very, very reliant on her older brother. She's so reliant in fact that after school he comes in and he puts her shoes on, ties her laces, packs her bag, puts her lunchbox in, picks up her book bag, puts her books in, takes her to the bus, carries all her stuff, takes her off to the bus. You know, the other day, they were out in the playground and Imogen didn't have her hat and it was hat day, so she had to sit under the big tree. Your 11 year old son came up, took his hat off his head, he put it on her head and sat under the tree for him. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do about this. <laughs> so, my husband and I are going, high five, double high five. <laughs> because I don't really care if my five year old is not independent. Actually, I could care less. My five-year-old has years to learn to be independent. My son has one opportunity to learn to care for his little sister, and that's it. And then he's doing a good job. What a wicked kid. I was so stoked that an 11-year-old would get up his whole lunchtime, put his hand on his sister, and go off and play. That is a fundamental cultural difference. My kids are taught to grow up being interdependent, knowing that someone's ringing me, hang on. <laughs> to grow up and to be interdependent. They're taught to rely on each other, they're taught that if we're not there, they can back each other up, they're taught that if anyone picks on the other one, they'll be in there. <laughs> that's my kids, that's how they're brought up. So that is a fundamental cultural value that's different. This teacher is coming from a value of, she is fine, she needs to tie her own shoes and pack her own bag and get herself to the bus. Well, no, actually she doesn't. She's got plenty of time to learn to do those things. And actually when she's 11, She'll look after my friend's child, who is now about 18 months old. So when that child's five, my daughter's job would be to look after that child. Because the, the teachable moment is for my child, that's inherent cultural difference. Okay? It's not right or wrong. I'm not saying independence isn't a good thing. I'm just saying we have different ideas about it. So you need to think about how does my perception of family, how does my cultural difference, Impose, how do my values and beliefs impose on teaching? And they do. Everything about you comes into your teaching and what you believe. You can't remain aloof from those things. But what you can do is recognise that they exist and they have imposition on the way in which we teach. So for teaching for cultural diversity, these things, these are kind of like the key things that you need to do. The first one is recognise that you're ethnocentric. And that's not a bad word, I'm ethnocentric. We are all ethnocentric. We see the worldview from our own experiences. It's very difficult to see the world from other people's views, but it is possible. But we actually have to be aware of that and push ourselves to do that. So by recognising, hey, I can't help it, I see the world through my little wire or glasses, sometimes that's scary, um, I, that's how I see the world, that's how I was brought up. I went to Warrell College, I, you know, I went back and taught there, I see the world through those wall of glasses. Sometimes I have to take them off and go, I work for Noitahu now, I have to see these through Noitahu glasses. I have to see these through South Island glasses. So I have to actually be aware that there are different perceptions. I have to know who I'm teaching. Who are those students? Where do they come from? Where are their places? If you don't know their whakapapa, well, you don't teach Maori culture, even if you teach carpentry. Where's your places? Where do you like to go to? Where do you affiliate to? What makes you feel good? What do you do on the weekend? So I understand who you are. I'm aware of the social and political environment. I am aware that you are poor. And that has an implication on your learning. I am aware that man, you need to get a job. I'm aware that there aren't that many jobs out there. I'm aware that we have a government that's very focused on that global creation of wealth. I'm aware that we have an education system that replicates what we do in America. Like the American educational system is really a global example of education, but we have national standards. 
we're going to lead tables, we're going to raid our schools, we're uh, thinking of privatising education through charter schools. These are the American concepts of education. So I'm aware that we have this system which doesn't innovate and create in its own culture and entity, it transports things from overseas to try and improve something which is inherently contextual. I need to know what is culturally appropriate strategies, okay? It was really inappropriate to walk into my daughter and go, Olivia, stand up in the back. Actually, it's inappropriate for all kids. Really inappropriate for her because that's one thing, don't show me up. If you come in and gave me the eyeball, she would have known how to go. She would have known what to do to get in. Okay? We understand that praising, if you've got a system that you work in your class where you have mentoring, often for Māori, it's better to praise the mentor, the tuakana, not the tainan. It's better to say, man, look at your teaching and the job that you've done helping this person produce that work. So we think about what are those culturally appropriate strategies. If I don't know them, how do I go out and find them? And saying people's names right does matter. Hiki Apara is actually right about that. Sorry, secondary school teachers. But we do need to make a real effort. It's not okay to say, I can't say to Tata, so I'm going to call you T. That's all right, eh? Because what's that student going to do? Yep, sweet. We're not going to say, not really, actually. I'd rather you call me my full name. So it's really important to do those simple things that actually seem quite easy. And I know the senior school teachers felt quite patronising, but we're still in a, in a system where that matters. We need to commit to a culture of caring and success. And by caring, it doesn't mean you say, I care about you and your feelings. It means I care about you, your achievement, your success, who you are, who you are in your family, what responsibilities you have. I care that just as 11 and needs to get out of class at 3 o'clock and he can't be kept in for detention because he has to go and pick up his little sister. I care about those things that really matter to him. We need to have curriculum relevance. And by that, I'm going back to that filing cabinet of bonds. Whatever your filing cabinet has in it, I need to make sure that the learning that I have is relevant to your cultural capital. What is it that you already know? And how do I build on that knowledge? Not how do I fill up your empty head with stuff that you know nothing about. And I need to have recognition that your cultural knowledge is valued. Okay, so quite often we have a system and we've moved to that system because of the overemphasis on maths and science that says, ah, that cultural knowledge doesn't really matter. But actually cultural knowledge does matter and it's inherent in all other knowledge. What often teachers will say, I teach chemistry, there is no culture in chemistry. Chemistry is chemistry. Mm -hmm. That's not actually true. There is culture in chemistry. There is culture in maths, physics, and all those things. So we don't have culture-free subjects. We need to think about that. We need to focus on these relational skills, not just our own. So yes, we need to be able to do all those things. We actually need to make sure that the people that we are teaching, whether we have them for 12 weeks, 3 months, or a year, or 3 years, that they have the ability to, to um, improvise, that they can resolve <coughs> conflicts, that they can make good decisions. Are you sitting there going, this is too much for me? I just teach welding? Do I really have to learn all these things? Well, yeah, because that welder has to work in a community, has to have relationships, has to have a boss, has to resolve conflicts, has to, has to be able to learn these skills in order to be part of that community, needs to have that social capital. So, Teaching for the future, you're right, it's all about innovation and it's all about creativity. And it's not always about doing what is dictated to us that we do, it's about thinking outside that square. It's about thinking about cultural diversity as a strength, that's what you bring, that is uniquely new and uniquely different to that learning. That is a wicked perception to have that perhaps I don't have on that piece of learning. It's relationship orientated, because I'm going to learn all those skills, like making friendships, resolving conflict, empathising through the relationships that I have, with you as a model of how those relationships work. And I'm going to be able to be connected to the community that I'm going to live and work in. So, I know someone's sitting out there with it on a shoot. We're going to talk about here, Tuki Ki Tuka, and Eddie's going to take you through how what I've just been talking about is actually embedded in a piece, in a new initiative that we've worked with with CPIT. So you're going to see what it looks like in practice.
apologies to Jim, he's probably thinking, oh, I need to get a refund, I've come all this way to hear um, everyone talking about my job, so probably just as a, a bit of a starter, um, you know, I'm not specifically talking about Māori Trades Training or the Māori Trades Training Initiative Te Toki Te Rika, uh, and really if you want to find out more about that, the best person to talk to will be Jim, uh, one of our practitioners, one of our tutors that's working with the boys in a hands-on level, so really what I what I wanted to talk about was a different phenomenon, which is really iwi engagement in tertiary and, and looking at partnership and at an aspirational level, what are some of the things that we're trying to look at in terms of developing social capital about education in a different form, which we're going to try and capitalise through the opportunity that's presented by Māori Trans Training. Does that make any sense? That's a no. <laughs> So, you know, really looking at what happened, I mean, you know, with, our, with February quake, um, yeah, it created a huge change for us and created lots of opportunities. And it shook up the ground, literally, but it also created an environment where everyone actually had to step back and reflect. And so really what I wanted to talk about is a phenomenon of iwi partnership in tertiary education and the opportunity that that creates. So, Ketoki Te Tereka was an initiative. Um, we were based... So Ngaitahu, we were based in the central city, um, so we had one prefab at Wigram. So I think we had um, Mark Solomon and about 12 people squashed around three desks and about 12 cell phones. And that was our tribal headquarters. And I was based actually um, in a tourism a subsidiary, so I said I'll stick my hand up because we had a lot of people leave. And so in terms of our tertiary partnership, we only had a team of six that go down to one person. So I volunteered to help out and I was ended up being based at the Kashmir Club um, working on a laptop um, behind the bar. And funnily enough, um, Christchurch Polytechnic were there as well, uh, Hana Uriga and Mark Solomon a couple of days after uh, the February quake. So look, this is the opportunity. We all know our city is buggered. Um, you know, this is the opportunity that we should be revitalising mighty trade strength. And so over a raspberry and coke, and a basket of wedges uh, at the bar. Um, Hunter and I started to progress a quarter all around Māori Trades Training and Te Toki Te Tereka. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. But as I said, really it's not so much looking at it as a program, but looking at it as a phenomenon in terms of iwi partnership and looking at the context of post-quake. That really the earthquake redefined a lot of things in Canterbury, but for my time, what it really did is it redefined the relationship and the contributions that Iwi can make to a civic identity. And that, that process is going on in terms of architecture and urban design, in terms of partnership, contributions that we can make. And really, it took you as this an example of how that new context in terms of Iwi partnership is playing out in tertiary education. So collaboration, I suppose, is going to be a big thing. A big part of that too is, it's, we're not really talking about, we've done lots of consultation, we have a history of attaching our, our logo, our brand to certain initiatives. And so it's really looking at collaboration where we've been actually able to input into you know, um, defining success. So that we always assume that, you know, we talk about cultural norms, that success, the definition of success is the same. We always get plagued with that because we're, we're tarred with the brush of the most success, uh, successful iwi. So we've just had that recently with our financial reports and you know, my day was put up there as the most a successful iwi. But of course, that's not the definition of success that is shared with Ngaitahu or within Māori world. We've made more money, we've made lots of money. Well, they, it's actually factually inaccurate because there are lots of other iwi that are doing really well, they just don't get it spread all out for the newspapers. But really for us, it's not how we would measure success. So we have a very different take on things and if anything, we have the lowest numbers of fluent speakers of our language. Our culture is still critically endangered. Um, we are at risk of losing our culture. So how you define success in terms of our own population, often it's a very different perspective to what you might see in the NBR in terms of a big corporate giant. So, it took Iki Tereka, Māori Change as an opportunity to conceive success, to define it differently. And then of course we're going to talk about some of the initiatives that we've been looking at. So really, partnership with Iwi, and really sort of trying to get across this thing in terms of moving beyond business as usual, standard normal practice. So I suppose beyond the norm, 
and being able to define success in a different way. So I suppose a key measure for us is that in terms of Māori trades training, we have to really articulate and develop what is specifically Māori about it. Is it trades training for Māori students, or is there a pedagogical difference, a different wider, a different flavour that comes with education for Māori? So we'll start with the norms. And so again, just talking about that, you know, that in terms of, you know, there's no such thing as a culturally free institution, that we all have a cultural lens that's been shaped by our background. You know, when we talk about it, you know, what, did Iwi, what was the perspective that Iwi bought? And um, you know, Mark Solomon, the first thing he said about Mighty Chains, it's like, oh, geez, do we have to feed everyone again? <laughs> so he was thinking of the hostel. So the first thing is in terms of, you know, there's this history, this legacy of Māori Trades training in terms of a partnership between Maito, CPIT and the Wesleyan Church. So even if you look at Mana Magazine at the moment, you'll see Weta Gardens got a bit of a comment in there. There's one regret in life was shutting down Māori Trades training in the 60s and 70s because it was so successful. So everyone loved the idea. In terms of Mana, it has huge status within our community. So if you look at our leadership, yeah, one of our ex-CEOs, um, yeah, fantastic mind, um, scholar, but he's also a fit attorney. Um, yeah, the CEO of Whale Watch was also a painter, so our, our current uh, generation of iwi leadership at some point have all come through the hostels. And so they have this network that they can draw on. Oops, sorry. So that's an evil back in the day, you might sort of see if anyone knows Terry Ryan, he's sort of in the middle. The only one without an afro, I think. <laughs> so, you know, it really drew upon a largely Māori rural population. Um, you know, from small towns, a lot of my uncles or my cousins were probably the result of unions that were formed in the, in the hostels. So, you know, they came from small villages on the coast, moved to the city, and it really was you know, a, a, a pathway in terms of education, in terms of skills and a career. But it also was partly around part of that whole sort of social agenda of urban migration. But you know, what worked about it, when you talk to all your uncles, like even uh, my uncles that after the quake all came back from Australia, they were working in the mines, and so they all came back to Kukut and Ehu and Marae. Um, you know, so that, that, those bonds are just so strong, and that's partly, you know, in terms of their perspective, it was a relational definition of success. That you have these cohorts, these comrade, uh, that camaraderie, that phenomenon that was so strong and that it's carried them throughout all their lives. Where, you know, someone might be a CEO of a, a Naito, uh, Turuna or Naito, but he also knows that he can ring up one of his old hostel mates who's a CEO from somewhere else and cook up a deal or whatever's going on. So that whole thing of collaboration, of success as a collective, not just as a uh, Individuals, and we also know too, in terms of achievement, that it created fantastic outcomes. So we knew the whole way it worked. We also knew it wouldn't work today. Um, yeah, that we didn't have any hostels. Uh, we didn't have any collective spaces that we could put anyone in. In Christchurch, at the moment, there's not enough accommodation for the people already in Christchurch. And that in many ways, we didn't need to urbanise our population because our population is already urbanised. If anything, the challenges we have is they're disconnected from their culture. You know, that we don't know them, we don't have much of a relevance in their daily lives. So how it worked in the past, those contingencies in the community, in that environment, aren't the same today, so we can't replicate what was done. Funding also has a bit to do with that as well. So we looked at, well, what were some of the values, what were some of the, the successes from that, and how can we rekindle those today? And so really those memories, combined with imagination, turned into new ideas. And so, he took it to Lika, so again, I'm not talking about this as a success, as a model, because it's really, it's too much, yeah, it's early days. That, um, but what I can say is that at an aspirational level, this is what here we are seeing in terms of the partnership, the opportunity that it presents. And in many ways, at an aspirational level, Tuki. So, toki ki te reka, you know, an ad's in the hand, but just even the simple thing of, yeah, an ad's is, yeah, is a symbol of a chief. Yeah, that it is, yeah, when you describe someone, if you were to describe Richie McCall in Māori, you would say, oh, he toki ia. 
you know, that he's, he's shout, you know. That, so, toki is a, a symbol in our culture that's associated with excellence. And, you know, inspiring Māori leadership within trade. So, again, when we talk about norms and when we talk about our discussions, what we've brought to it, that different conception of success, a key thing is, of course, not talking about when you talk with funders, often everyone's talking about beneficiaries to workers. And we've really had to fight to say, well, we're not really about that. We're not about taking our relations and turning them into a cheap labour workforce for a part of our employer. That it's really around leadership. You know, an opportunity that the, um, the Regal presents in terms of growing Māori entrepreneurship, Māori business. So again, the key thing you'll probably hear in our hui is, yeah, it's not about creating brown hammerheads, about a brown labour workforce, it's about creating opportunities for Māori business, for increasing the household um, income of um, your own Māori whānau. So really the, the perspective that in terms of Māori, we're not involved in the construction industry at all, that we're really looking at social capital. So you have a rebuild, the $30 billion investment that is going to go into the Christchurch rebuild is going to create an opportunity for us to accelerate the development of Māori capability and a Māori workforce. So there you go, it's a catalyst for social change. Oh, Kahu did this photo, I really like it, but it's plays in terms of conception of success. Yeah, it's one of the painting uh, cohorts, and then you've got also and one of the older painting cohorts as well from the 70s, so he's played around with that photo. But it's really around repositioning it, that, you know, that even though it is different, how do we try and capitalise on the strengths of that legacy? Yeah, and that, that pride, that mana, to make our young trade trainees of today proud about those successes. So again, talked a bit about that, so yeah, shifting success away from any really sort of a pass-fail competency to really trying to advocate for success and yeah, measuring success in terms of relationships. Uh, a part of that as well was also that, that yeah, our definition of success was also informed by industry. So um, we had a lot of our commercial partners and especially Nancy McConnell and yeah, the, key, the consistent messages we keep hearing from industry around soft skills, that they were looking for character, for attributes, not necessarily too, too focused on terms of technical abilities. So in terms of our definitions of success, it included things, you know, what industry brought with simple things around nutrition, around attitudes, around how to be able to resolve conflict, is that sometimes it can be a bit tense in terms of those work sites, so a whole bunch of different attributes and characteristics. And then of course, Iwi was very much focusing around whanaumatana, around relationships. Simple things like, um, you know, um, knowing our tribal histories. You know, that you think of all those old buildings, we're largely built, yeah, it's, I'd say even maybe five or ten Uru Park, you know, so our ancestral burial grounds. We've never been able to do anything because there's been a 150 year old building planted on top of it. Now all those buildings are gone. You know, so Totahi, you all know, hear all Totahi? Yeah, so Totahi was a person, he was an ancestor, he was buried underneath the church. Now the church is gone and now everyone's actually got the opportunity to think, well, how would we like to commemorate the founder of this space, yeah, the person that gave the name for Toto? Because we've actually got the chance for once to do that. And part of the investment in terms of energy and support for Māori trades is we're saying, well, there's going to be a workforce that's going to have to work on those wahi tapu. Not just the old wahi tapu, but the new wahi tapu. How are you going to deal with CTV? You know, how, how they, you know, we need to ensure that we have a workforce that can respect all of those wahi tapu, those urupa, those burial grounds. So part of that is they also learn a lot about our traditions. So sorry, so again, just looking at different lenses in terms of what we would want to see in terms of, I suppose you could say, not so much a graduate profile, but just in terms of those attributes and characters. So not just transmitting knowledge, but also looking at yeah, a relational definition of success. So I suppose by that I just mean that they're part of a community, they're part of a, a Māori trades network, because that was really what happened in the past, and that through that phenomenon, through that community, that network, they were able to support each other and accelerate their development.
suppose one of the learnings and yeah, the key determinant for success, everyone kept talking about soft schools. And just through even the term soft schools, it's one of the places that are secondary to what was defined as the hard technical schools. But what we found is that actually in terms of success, it was actually the soft schools that were the key determinant. So you know, building those relationships as a cohort, you know, creating a culture where they can support each other and succeed as a collective. So again, I suppose, just sounds real simple, but I suppose the key thing is you know, we just didn't want to instill or impart knowledge. We wanted them to grow as people and have culture as sort of that foundation for personal and professional growth. So that was our conception of success anyway. So again, through that process of plenty of hui and discussions, and as I say, largely what I'm talking about is aspirational, we're not there yet, but it's really trying to push it from a focus of skill acquisition, human capital, you're focusing on workforce, way to make money, to looking at, well, how can we actually shift the social fabric of our community so that, you know, all those Māori that are at the, the top of the bad statistics and the bottoms of the good ones, how can we transform the social fabric of our community so that we can affect rapid social change? Okay? Part of the challenge is, well, how do you teach that? How do you instill whanaunatanga? How do you grow, you know, that sense of camaraderie, that sense of whanaunatanga? And so again, an intervention, so... One thing that we are trialling is really a, the Hitoki Work Readiness Passport. So it's not a program, we're not allowed to call it a program because it's not institutionalised. So it's an intervention that we've has really been able to capture the different notions of success that's informed both by industry and largely from um, by Hawkins Construction and then also in terms of Waitakuta. So there's three core partners, Hawkins Construction, Tūruna and Waitahu, in the Christchurch Polytech, so Hannah's in there. And what it does is it, it's, I suppose you could say it's a proactive developmental curricula. So it's pushing curriculum beyond the hard stuff, the hard skills, and it, it's really, a, I suppose you could say, a way that we can capture and measure a curriculum that's focusing around those critical issues. So if I can think of just an example, so maybe like drugs, yeah, which is a, a key um, issue in terms of the construction industry. So having industry, having Māori social workers, and then having what I saw to Māiriki in there, who's the guy with the moko, they actually been able to work with the students and talk about you know, addiction. So from an industry perspective, from a Māori social worker being able to equip them with tools in terms of if they are using, how to get off, and then also having your tohuna that talking about that sort of that whole world perspective. So again, one issue, one challenge, critical issue, critical barrier to success, but tapping into all of these different services, networks and perspectives to sort of get a more collaborative approach to how to deal with that issue. So just some more things there, but um, so I'll just look at one group that again, obviously it's cohort based, and that's the key challenge for us as well, Okay, what, what's Māori about Māori trades training? Yeah, what's different about it? What's different in terms of pedagogy, in terms of delivery? And as I said, not there yet, but it's aspirational and we are working on it. But you know, just a simple thing of just having that cohort structure. Yeah, this was a, a group, uh, Nick was the tutor at Jermaine. Yeah, the, um, in terms of conceiving success, you know, they sung us. They composed the most beautiful waiata uh, and they were amazing singers. So, Again, it was just a different perspective. When you think about well, what was success for us, well, that was a, a beautiful example. But they were strong, so strong in their culture, so strong in their phenomena as a cohort, that they composed the most beautiful way that they captured the essence of their cobra culture. And, you know, again, as I said, not there yet, but um, you're know, building a Māori trades network community, so we're getting old boys that are coming in, so old boys that are part of that experience, that want to be part of something greater than themselves and contribute back to the Cobra Club. So there was Anthony Hiko, so he mentored the group and, um, and that photo, so the, I think the painting decorated, so as I see, they're getting those old boys coming in, mentoring the students, 
even talking about, you can see that Terry Ryan's a sort of a resident whakapapa expert, and talking about yeah, just sort of sharing the history in terms of Māori trades trading and how they fit into that continuum of the legacy. And of course, the Hitoki Haka. So, just something as simple as that, they have their own identity and that they have their own Haka. So, I just thought, again, it's a work in progress. Um, really, again, not looking at it in terms of the phenomenon of Māori trades trading, but just looking at it where you can say it's a unique phenomenon that you've actually got iwi and industry working and collaborating in an equal partnership with the tertiary provider. Um, that partnership is uh, iwi lead and the centralised lines of accountability sit with iwi, so that's revisioned, I suppose, the role that iwi can play in terms of tertiary. Um, yeah, the, the focus isn't purely just in terms of knowledge outcomes, but it's really around you know, building a, a community around those individuals as a, a group of learners. Yeah, um, there were so many things that we wanted to capture that wouldn't fit within the existing curriculum. So the, the work readiness passport as an intervention is a way in which we can put a whole bunch of proactive you're know, trying to anticipate critical issues, so there are going to be barriers in terms of their career. So we've tried to be proactive in terms of having a whole body of developmental curricula, right from nutrition, budgeting, leadership, Māori history, all sorts of stuff that gets preloaded and delivered as well as part of the program. Um, you know, one thing you know, that we've really got to work on is also just in terms of sharing knowledge. So. Yeah, as I said, in terms of collaboration, as a social um, activity, but, you know, part of it is it's a huge learning curve for us in terms of um, what we can learn about trades and what we can learn about tertiary, and also what we can contribute and share in terms of that Māori history, that connection to space. And so we have just some more things like a governance group, operations team, so we have existing structures which are really about facilitating collaboration and exchange of information. It's pushing it beyond the classroom, so even just simple things in terms of engaging, learning Hebrew history, walking around the CBD and understanding all what's. Yeah, I think one of our ones said, um, you need invisible, uh, what do you call it, X-ray goggles to see Naito history on Christchurch. Because all the buildings are all English, and that all of our traditions and history are underneath those buildings. And so I suppose you could say we equip them all with X-ray goggles. So that we take them around and we talk about those, those sacred places so that when the city is rebuilt, we've also got a workforce that can really express that and you know, build that memory into that built environment. So that's probably all from me. So, kia ora koutou. And when we talk about it, you know, what, did Iwi, what was the perspective that Iwi bought? And um, you know, Mark Solomon, the first thing he said about Mighty Chains, it's like, oh, Geez, do we have to feed everyone again? <laughs> so he was thinking of the hostels. So the first thing is in terms of, you know, there's this history, this legacy of Māori Trades training in terms of a partnership between Waito, CPIT and the Wesleyan Church. So even if you look at Money Magazine at the moment, you'll see Weta Gardner's got a bit of a comment in there. His one regret in life was shutting down Māori Trades training in the 60s and 70s because it was so successful. So everyone loved the idea. In terms of mana, it has huge status within our community. So if you look at our leadership, yeah, one of our ex-CEOs, um, yeah, fantastic mind, um, scholar, but he's also a fitter tuner. Um, yeah, the CEO of Whale Watch was also a painter. So our, our current uh, generation of iwi leadership at some point have all come through the hostels. And so they have this network that they can draw from. Oops, sorry. So that's the record back in the day. You might sort of see if anyone knows Terry Ryan, he's sort of in the middle. He's the only one without an afro, I think. <laughs> so, you know, it really drew upon a largely Māori rural population. Um, you know, from small towns. A lot of my uncles or my cousins were probably the result of unions that were formed in the, in the hostel. So, yeah, they came from small villages on the coast, moved to the city. And it really was you know, a, a pathway in terms of education, in terms of skills and a career, but it also was partly around part of that whole sort of social agenda of urban migration. 
But you know what worked about it? When you talk to all your uncles, like even uh, my uncles that after the quake all came back from Australia, they were working in the mines, and so they all came back to cook at the Ihu and Marae. Um, you know, so that, that, those bombs are just so strong, and that's partly, you know, in terms of their perspective, it was a relational definition of success. That you have these cohorts, these comrade, uh, that camaraderie, that phenomenon that was so strong, and that it's carried them throughout all their lives. Where you know, someone might be a CEO of a, a Naito, uh, Teruna or Naito, but he also knows that he can ring up one of his old hostel mates who's a CEO from somewhere else and cook up a deal or whatever's going on. So that whole thing of collaboration, of success as a collective, not just as a uh, Individuals, and we also know too, in terms of achievement, that it created fantastic outcomes. So we knew the old way worked. We also knew it wouldn't work today. Um, yeah, that we didn't have any hostels. Uh, we didn't have any collective spaces that we could put anyone in. And Christchurch, at the moment, is not enough accommodation for the people already in Christchurch. And in many ways, we didn't need to urbanise our population because our population is already urbanised. If anything, the challenges we have is they're disconnected from their culture. You know, that we don't know them, we don't have much of a relevance in their daily lives. So how it worked in the past, those contingencies in the community, in that environment, aren't the same today, so we can't replicate what was done. Funding also has a bit to do with that as well. So we looked at, well, what were some of the values, what were some of the, the successes from that, and how can we rekindle those today? And so really those memories, combined with imagination, turned into new ideas. And so, Hitsokiki Tereka, so again, I'm not talking about this as a success, as a model, because it's really, it's too much, yeah, it's early days. That, um, but what I can say is that at an aspirational level, this is what iwi are seeing in terms of the partnership, the opportunity that it presents. And in many ways, at an aspirational level, Tuki, so, Tuki Ki you know, an ad's in the hand. But just even the simple thing of, yeah, an ad's is, yeah, is a symbol of a chief. Yeah, that it is, yeah, when you describe someone, if you were to describe Richie McCall and Māori, you would say, oh, he Tuki Ia. Yeah, that he's, he's sharp, you know. That, so, Tuki is a, a symbol in our culture that's associated with excellence. And you know, inspiring Māori leadership within trade. So again, when we talk about norms and when we talk about our discussions, what we've brought to it, that different conception of success, the key thing is, of course, not talking about when you talk with funders, often everyone's talking about beneficiaries to workers. And we've really had to fight to say, well, we're not really about that. We're not about taking our relations and turning them into a cheap labour workforce for a park our employer. That it's really around leadership. You know, an opportunity that the, um, the Rebuild presents in terms of growing Māori entrepreneurship, Māori business. So again, the key thing you'll probably hear in our hui is you know, it's not about creating brown hemahens, about a brown labour workforce. It's about creating opportunities for Māori business, for increasing the household um, income of um, your own Māori whānau. So really the, the perspective that in terms of Māita, we're not involved in the construction industry at all, that we're really looking at social capital. So you have a rebuild, the $30 billion investment that is going to go into the Christchurch rebuild is going to create an opportunity for us to accelerate the development of Māori capability and a Māori workforce. So you know, it's a catalyst for social change. Kahu did this photo, I really like it, but I suppose in terms of conception of success, yeah, it's one of the painting uh, cohorts, and then you've got also one of the older painting cohorts as well from the 70s, so he's played around with that photo. But it's really around repositioning it, that, you know, that even though it is different, how do we try and capitalise on the strengths of their legacy? Yeah, and that, that pride, that mana, to make our young trade trainees of today proud about those successes. So again, talked a bit about that, so you know, shifting success away from really sort of a pass-fail competency to really trying to advocate for success and you know, measuring success in terms of relationships. Uh, a part of that as well was also that the, you know, our definition of success was also informed by industry. So 
So um, you heard a lot about commercial partners, and especially Nancy McConnell. And you know, the, the, the consistent messages we keep hearing from industry around soft skills, that they were looking for character, for attributes, not necessarily too, too focused on terms of technical abilities. So in terms of our definitions of success, it included things, you know, what industry brought with simple things around nutrition, around attitudes, around how to be able to resolve conflict, is that sometimes it can be a bit tense in terms of those work sites, so a whole bunch of different attributes and characteristics. And then of course, Iwi was very much focusing around whanaungatana, around relationships. Simple things like um, you know, um, knowing our tribal histories. You, know, that you think of all those old buildings, we largely built, yeah, there's, I'd say there maybe five or ten you know, so our ancestral burial grounds. We've never been able to do anything because there's been 150 year old building planted on top of that. Now all those buildings are gone. Yeah, so Totahi, you all Totahi? Yeah, so Totahi was a person, he was an ancestor, he was buried underneath the church. Now the church is gone and now everyone's actually got the opportunity to think, well, how would we like to commemorate the founder of this space, yeah, the person that gave the name all Totahi? Because we've actually got the chance for once to do that. And Part of the investment in terms of energy and support for Māori trades is we're saying, well, there's going to be a workforce that's going to have to work on those wahi tapu. Not just the old wahi tapu, but the new wahi tapu. How are you going to deal with CTV? You know, how, how are they, you know, we need to ensure that we have a workforce that can respect all of those wahi tapu, those urupā, those burial grounds. So part of that is they also learn a lot about our traditions. So sorry, so again, just looking at different lenses in terms of what we would want to see in terms of, I suppose you could say, not so much a graduate profile, but just in terms of those attributes and characters. So not just transmitting knowledge, but also looking at yeah, a relational definition of success. So I suppose by that I just mean that they're part of a community, they're part of a, a mighty trades network, because that was really what happened in the past. And that through that phenomena, through that community, that network, they were able to support each other and accelerate their development. So I suppose one of the learnings, you know, the key determinant for success, everyone keep talking about soft schools. And just through even the term soft schools, it's one of the places that are secondary to what was defined as the hard technical schools. But what we found is that actually in terms of success, it was actually the soft schools that were, that were the key determinant. So you know, building those relationships as a cohort, you know, creating a culture where they can support each other and succeed as a collective. So again, I suppose, just sounds real simple, but I suppose the key thing is you know, we just didn't want to instill or impart knowledge. We wanted them to grow as people and have culture as sort of that foundation 